I got the idea for this video from a channel called Decades, which is a really great little history channel. So if you're interested in just history more broadly outside of music history, then please check them out. They're really cool. I'm sure they aren't the first people to do stuff like this. I mean, it's all of Watch Mojo's business model, but I really liked the way they did it. And they are the ones who gave me the inspiration to do a music history version of it. So here are 15 random facts from music history. A little bit of a disclaimer before we get into this. I consider myself more of a storyteller than a historian, so I'm maybe not quite as adept at rifling through different things and figuring out the truth from a long-standing myth. I've done my very best to verify all of these, but there are some that might not be true, and feel free to let me know in the comments if they're not. Speaking of things that aren't quite verified, I'm starting off pretty hot with a story that's probably not true. It is a fact that Debbie Harry, the famous front woman of Blondie, and arguably the coolest girl in the universe in my completely unbiased opinion, claims that she was almost abducted by one of the most infamous people in American history. In the early to mid-70s, Debbie lived in a pretty seedy area of Manhattan's Lower East Side. It was famous for its drug addicts and its crime. She lived right down the street from a building where a bunch of recently released prisoners lived. So one night when she was looking to get uptown, I think to like Max's Kansas City or one of those other bars, she went looking for a taxi. And as she tells it, a white car pulled up and offered her a ride. She hesitated because she immediately got a pretty strange feeling from the car and the person driving it, but eventually she got in. And then she said, quote, so I was sitting there and he wasn't really talking to me. Automatically, I sort of reached to roll down the window and realized there was no door handle, no window crank, no nothing. The inside of the car was totally stripped out, end quote. So panicking, she reached through the window, opened the car from the outside, and then fell out of the car in the middle of the street while the car was moving. The driver didn't stop. They didn't turn back around to get her. They just kept on going. Lucky for her, she wasn't injured. Nothing all that bad happened, but I'm sure it was a very traumatic experience all the same. But she said it wasn't an experience that she thought about all that often. There were several things that happened to her in the early days in New York that were very traumatic until a few years later when she saw a magazine cover. It was an article about a recently executed serial killer named Named Ted Bundy. She said she hadn't thought about that experience in 15 years, but when she saw that picture and read the description of how Ted Bundy operated, she knew it was him. But it's worth noting that at the time that Debbie claims this happened, Ted was thought to be active in Florida, but the car that she describes getting in does almost perfectly match the car that Ted drove. The authorities have never commented on whether or not Debbie's story is even possible or true. I mean, why would they? They have no reason to do that. It's also worth noting that certain things might have got mixed up in the way Debbie remembered what happened and certain dates didn't quite line up. I mean, Debbie did her fair share of drugs. She did quite a few people's fair share of drugs, so it's possible things just got mixed up in her mind. Regardless, she still claims it's true. She said, quote, I've been debunked, actually, by those people that debunk you or whatever. They say he wasn't in New York at that time, but I think they're really wrong, end quote. When Public Enemy burst onto the scene in the late 80s, they redefined what hip-hop could be. Their album, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, gave hip-hop a distinctly political edge. Chuck D and Flava Flav set out to make a hip-hop album that was similar to Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, which was very celebrated and noted for its political and social activism. It's just full of social commentary and all the important things. But when they became popular, people really didn't understand Flava Flav's point in the band. Neither did Def Jam, because when they signed Public Enemy, they originally asked asked Chuck D if they could just sign him, but Chuck refused and brought in Flava Flav with him. But the fact that most people probably don't know is that Flava Flav is actually a musical prodigy. By the age of five, he had taught himself how to play the piano. Soon after that, he mastered the drums and the guitar. According to Chuck D, Flava Flav is proficient in 15 different instruments. He also went to culinary school, so you know, maybe he makes a great meal too. Louis Armstrong is probably my favorite musician of the jazz era. He's really fun to learn about and really, really talented. He's also the first black musician to do a lot of things, including write an autobiography. But in 1937, he became the first black musician to host a radio show. The Rudy Valley Show, also known as the Fleischmann's Yeast Show, in case you wanted a catchier title. 
aired on NBC from 1929 to 1936. But in April of 1937, Rudy Valley wanted to go to England for an extended stay to see the coronation of King George VI, which would have left his radio show without a host. So Rudy suggested his friend Louis Armstrong. So Louis stepped in and became the first black entertainer to host a commercially sponsored, nationally broadcasted radio show. I think many people have heard the phrase Tin Pan Alley as just kind of a catch-all term for the American music industry, but they don't really know where it came from and maybe don't know that it's a real place. In about 1885 or somewhere around then, almost every major American music publisher set up shop in the same district in New York City. And many of them set up really horrible sounding cheap pianos in like the lobbies and the showrooms of their offices so prospective songwriters could come and demonstrate their songs and then maybe potentially get a songwriting deal out of it. This was well before you could just mail in your demo tape or email a link to your SoundCloud. The most common theory about how the name actually came to be is that the New York Herald first said it derogatorily about the sound of so many different cheap pianos all playing at once, making it sound like someone was banging tin pans in an alley. I grew up surrounded by CDs. The memory of snapping those little plastic cases still haunts me. But what was the first commercially released CD? Well, that's kind of a tricky question. Most people think it's Born in the USA by Bruce Springsteen. It was manufactured for release on September 21st, 1984, which makes it the first commercially manufactured CD in the United States. But CDs were first introduced in Japan in October of 1982. So a lot of people say that Billy Joel's 52nd Street was the first CD. But that's just because it was the first one listed in the catalog of 50 different CDs that were all released on the same day. So no one is quite sure what the actual first CD ever released was. I did see something else that like ABBA was the first ones to record an album for release on a CD. So maybe theirs is the first. It's it's all kind of murky and no one really knows what the first one was. But albums existed long before CDs, so this got me thinking, what was the first album ever released? If we're talking about the first recorded music, that's all the way back in Paris in 1860, but that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an LP, a collection of songs that are meant to be together. So that kind of depends on your definition of an album. In the early 1900s, most labels would release singles because at that time, a typical 10-inch disc could only hold about three minutes of music per side, so you just kind of had to release a single with a B-side. And then they would take a bunch of those singles and put them together in one collection, similar to how you would take a bunch of different photos and put them together in an album. So the singles put together became an album. And then Columbia Records released the long playing record format in 1948. No one, at least as far as I can tell, is quite sure what the very first album released in this new format was, but recently someone did look through Columbia's archives looking at the serial numbers to determine what the oldest one was. And by doing that, they determined that the first long playing disc that Columbia produced featured the Philharmonic Symphony of New York. And I don't know about you, but that's kind of underwhelming to me. Frank Sinatra's temper, especially aimed against members of the press, is something of a legend, and it once got him stranded in a foreign country. In 1974, he came out of a brief retirement to tour Australia for the first time in 15 years. Reporters dogged him every step of the way. Everything he did, he was just hounded by the press. At his hotel, one of his bodyguards wrapped an electrical cord around a photographer's throat and continued to threaten all of the reporters present, and it just quickly became a huge mess. At his sold-out show in Melbourne that night, Frank made some pretty horrible and sexist comments about the female reporters. I mean, he made horrible comments about all of the reporters, but he singled out the female ones for special comment. And that didn't go down too well. The Australian press demanded that he apologize. Of course, old Frankie refused. So the unions, in an act of solidarity, started cutting him off. He lost lighting, sound, and backing band privileges for his shows. He lost wait staff in his hotels. He lost catering. And through all of that, he still refused to apologize. Instead, he tried to just leave the country. So the transport workers union refused to refuel his private jet, effectively leaving him stranded in Australia where he could get no help from anyone. It's a much longer story. He tries to get the American embassy involved. It's a whole big thing. I suggest you look into it if you want to know more about this. It's really interesting. There's a podcast called The Dollop that does a whole episode on this. It was filmed live in Australia, and I think they did a really good job just breaking down the whole story. He eventually did give a half-hearted apology and left the country. 
When Elvis's records hit the UK, it started a revolution. It ignited a craze of copycat bands who all wanted to play this new style of music that Elvis was pioneering. However, people in the UK never got a chance to see him play live. In fact, Elvis never toured internationally, unless you count that one time he was in the military, but no one probably counts that, and it's for a very good reason that he never went overseas. In February of 1955, Elvis met Colonel Tom Parker. Over the next few years, Tom got more and more control over Elvis's life and his career, and it got to the point that he was basically handling all things Elvis. And Tom would not let Elvis play overseas, because he was worried that if they left the country, they wouldn't be allowed back in. You see, the colonel wasn't who he said he was. He wasn't even a colonel. He was born in the Netherlands, and he entered the United States illegally. He got a job on a ship, and when they got close to a port, he jumped overboard and swam ashore, and then like changed his name, changed everything about him, and became Colonel Tom Parker. So since Tom had no interest in letting Elvis off the leash to go tour Europe on his own, he just refused to let Elvis play overseas and made him stay in America where they were safe. In the 60s, the Beach Boys dominated the pop charts with their fun songs about surfing and girls and high school and cars and all things beach and fun and sun. They kind of exemplified that California teenage aesthetic. The only problem is that none of them really surfed. Okay, one did. The drummer, Dennis Wilson, really enjoyed surfing, and he even convinced his brother Brian to start writing songs about it because he thought it was so much fun. But none of the others wanted anything to do with it. Brian Wilson didn't even swim. He was partially deaf in one ear after getting hit in that ear, and in that time, doctors often advised people who were deaf or who had ear troubles to not swim because they thought the pressure change could impact the rest of your hearing, and Brian was very protective over his hearing. I mean, you can understand that. So he just kind of refused to go into water, and that eventually just led to a fear of the ocean and swimming in general. So despite writing songs that epitomized surf culture of the 60s, most of them had no idea what they were talking about. In the late 60s, a young single mother named Vicki Jones was struggling. She spent her days singing with her church choir and her evenings singing in clubs for basically no money. But she really idolized Aretha Franklin, who was a woman like her from a similar background facing similar struggles, who really made something of herself. She idolized her so much that she started to sound like her. Maybe not even intentionally, but she sounded so much like Aretha that other people started to notice, including Lavelle Hardy, who then hatched a scheme. He told Vicky that he booked her a gig opening for Aretha in Florida, except when Vicky got to Florida, she learned that Lavelle wanted her to impersonate Aretha instead of open for her. Vicky adamantly refused, so Lavelle threatened to throw her in the bay, so Vicky said, all right. When Aretha's team heard about it, they got the authorities involved. And at her trial, Vicky was asked to sing. When she did, the judge decided that she sounded so much like Aretha that the people who went to see her weren't actually defrauded. Two weeks after that, Vicky played with Duke Ellington, who kind of convinced her to step outside of this Aretha persona and try her own thing, which she did, so then Vicky was able to launch her own minorly successful music career. Vicky was able to get enough success that a singer in Richmond, Virginia started to impersonate her. Have you ever wondered how Paul David Hewson became Bono? Well, when he was growing up in Dublin, some of his closest friends became involved in a surrealist street gang, and they had a habit of giving nicknames to everyone. They tried out a few different names for Paul, including Houseman, Bon Murray, Bono Vox of O'Connell Street, which then became just Bono Vox, and then just Bono. But why Bono Vox? Where did that come from? That was the name of a hearing aid store that was just off of Dublin's principal street, which in turn, Bono Vox comes from a Latin term meaning good voice. So when Paul, now Bono, heard that, he decided he liked the name. In 1991, Nirvana released an album called Nevermind, and the world never quite looked the same afterwards. It introduced the mainstream world to grunge, and it breathed life back into rock and roll, and is arguably one of the most important and most influential albums in history. So it's a real shame that the band weren't able to celebrate it the way they wanted at their own album release party. Nirvana came from the underground scene, and they were suddenly on this big label. So this release party was full of a whole bunch of industry bigwigs and people in suits and hors d'oeuvres and 
just didn't really make sense for a band that came from where Nirvana came from. But for a while, they were cordial and they were just sipping their cocktails and making polite conversation. But eventually they hit a breaking point. They started to just get drunker and drunker. And eventually when the beer ran out, they switched to Jack Daniels and things really ramped it up a notch. One account reads, quote, After the band finished ripping all the posters off the walls, Chris heaved a tamale at Kurt and Dylan Carlson. Kurt remembers retaliating with a salvo of guacamole. Soon food was flying everywhere, with no regard for the industry geeks whose suits were getting splattered. So they got kicked out of their own album release party for starting a food fight. If you went out on the street and took a random survey and asked people what was the first rap song, most people would say, I have no idea, why would I know that, what are you doing? But you might get a few people who would say Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang, and that wouldn't be far off. That was the first song that broke hip hop into the mainstream. It was the first rap song that hit the top 40. But the honor of the first song that featured rapping to hit number one belongs to Blondie with Rapture in 1980. Rapture was also the first song with rapping to feature on MTV. So if Rapper's Delight isn't the first recorded rap song, what is? Well, back in 1979, a few months before Rapper's Delight was released, a group called the Fatback Band released King Tim the Third. Bill Curtis, who was the drummer and the leader of the Fatback Band, wanted to put a rap into a song, but no one in their band really knew how to rap at all. But one of the members of the band said that they did know a rapper, so Bill Curtis hunted down Tim Washington. They just kind of placed Tim in a booth and told him to rap which he did. So King Tim the Third, which is on kind of an obscure disco album by a little known band, is technically the first recorded rap song that we know about. If you think of the best guitarist of all time, your mind probably jumps to people like Jimmy Page or Jimi Hendrix or Eddie Van Halen, maybe someone like Brian May. But what band had the best collection of guitarists of all time? Of course, that's debatable, but what's not debatable is that the British rock band The Yardbirds had some of the most high-profile rock guitarists of all time pass through their ranks. When the band started in 1963, their lead guitarist was a little guy named Eric Clapton. But then the band shifted to more of a pop focus, and Eric still wanted to play blues, so he left. And he was replaced by a guitarist named Jeff Beck. About 20 months after that, Jeff Beck was fired for consistently not showing up to rehearsals or shows. So the Yardbirds let their new rhythm guitarist take over the lead guitar parts. His name was Jimmy Page, who would leave the band in 1968 to form Led Zeppelin. So most people say that the Yardbirds had the biggest collection of talent of any rock band in history, but there's another British blues band who I think at least deserves a look. Their name was John Mayall's Blues Breakers. After Eric Clapton left the Yardbirds, he joined the Blues Breakers. And when he eventually left the Blues Breakers, he was replaced by a guy named Peter Green, who would leave the Blues Breakers to form Fleetwood Mac. Peter Green would leave the Blues Breakers, and he was replaced by Mick Taylor, who went on to have a really successful career with the Rolling Stones. At some point or another, the Blues Breakers also had Harvey Mandel, the guitarist from Canned Heat, Jesse Ed Davis, Rick Vito, who ended up replacing Lindsey Buckingham in Fleetwood Mac, and David Raskin. So, sound off in the comments, who do you think had the best collection of rock guitarists in music history? I think by this point, most people know about the sundry dating history of Fleetwood Mac, from John and Christine McVie getting divorced and Christine dating the lighting director, to Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks and their brutal breakup that created so many great songs on Rumors and elsewhere, and even Mick Fleetwood, who was going through a divorce with his wife Jenny Boyd, and how Mick's wife had an affair with Bob Weston, a one-time guitarist in Fleetwood Mac. But one relationship gets a little bit lost in that mix. During the Australia portion of their long tour in support of Rumors, Mick Fleetwood finally let his feelings for Stevie Nicks boil over. Those feelings had been brewing ever since the first time he saw Stevie in a studio in 1974. But by the time they got to New Zealand and Australia on that tour, they had blossomed into something more, with Mick even confessing to Lindsey Buckingham that he thought he was in love with Stevie. Which was probably a bummer for Mick's on-and-off wife, Jenny Boyd. At the time, they were trying to work things out, and Stevie was dating Don Henley from the Eagles. The affair didn't last long, but at least according to Mick, it was very intense. Mick said that they both really loved each other, but they decided that they couldn't let it go on, they couldn't let it advance, because if they did, it would probably kill the band. And at that point, nothing was more important to Mick Fleetwood than Fleetwood Mac. So they called it off. The affair stayed largely hidden until Mick wrote about it in his 1990 memoir. 
There are rumors that this memoir was the reason that Stevie and Christine ended up leaving Fleetwood Mac, but they all say that that's not true. Stevie had decided to leave before she had even read the book, and Stevie said she wasn't really even all that upset that Mick decided to talk about their affair in his book. She said she knew it would always come out someday, and then she said, quote, It was a great love affair, something I would never trade in a million years. End quote. So there you have it. There's 15 random facts and random stories from music history. Let me know what your favorites were in the comments. If you like this video, give it a like. Be sure to check out Decades and their awesome take on this concept. And subscribe for more stories from music history.